morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our resume writing, um, government resume writing workshop. If you can hear me, please wave your hands, students. I see some of you are, are on and joining us. Good morning to you all. Go ahead and put good morning in the chat. So glad you can make it. Just a couple of house rules before we start. Um, I'm sure Mr. Gibbs also has your mics muted. I ask that you keep your mics on mute during the presentation. Also, please hold all questions until Mr. Nelson is finished. I'll repeat, hold your questions until the end of the presentation. I want you all to welcome Mr. Bryce Nelson. Wave your hand, say hello, put a hand clap in the chat. He is the presenter for today. Who is giving us this great sound wisdom and knowledge on how to prepare your resume for the government, okay? Once again, government resume writing. If you are texting or chatting to friends, please tell them to enter quietly. Once again, share the house rules with them. We will address all of your concerns at the end, okay? So I present to you all Mr. Bryce Nelson. He will take it from here. And guys, once again, make sure your mics are muted. And if you, well, I see most of your cameras are off, which is fine. Um, if you do choose to turn your camera on, if you need to step away to handle business, please um, turn your camera off, okay? Thank you all so much for your time. Mr. Nelson, you have the floor. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Ms. Townsend. And so, um, welcome everyone. I am grateful to have this opportunity to uh, provide this presentation to you today. Um, as has been stated, my name is Bryce Nelson. I am a representative from uh, the Defense Information Systems Agency and specifically the Office of Strategic Outreach and Talent Acquisition. Um, the main purpose or objective of today's presentation is to give you information uh, and some guidance regarding the federal application process and more specifically, the federal resume writing process. Before we jump in to the formal pre portion of my presentation, let's see. I would like to give a quick introduction of, of who I am, uh, my background professionally, uh, where I come from, and, and just allow you to know me a little bit better that way. So as has been stated, I do work for the Defense Information Systems Agency, or DISA. Um, you'll learn very quickly that the government speaks in acronyms, right? Um, we use a lot of three and four letter uh, acronyms, um, and uh, it really can be a language in and of itself. And so again, I work for DISA. Um, it's not DISA. A lot of people make that mistake, DISA. Um, and I'm happy to be here as part of my normal day today. Um, I am a management analyst, uh, meaning that I manage various programs as they relate to our uh, human resource portion of our workforce, and I am a training manager. As far as my background is concerned, I do hold a bachelor's degree in business administration as well as a master's degree in human resource management, both from Utah State University. Um, I have oh, go close to 15 years of professional experience in human resource management. Um, majority of my career has been spent in the higher education sector, um, working at Utah State University, as well as Salt Lake Community College, managing, managing various human resource programs um, and efforts in, in that area. I do also work as an adjunct instructor uh, for the BYU-Idaho Management Department, um, and I routinely provide instruction um, as a guest lecturer to various excuse me, organizations and institutions. As you can see on there, I have also worked for the United States Air Force, specifically the 209th Missile Maintenance Division at Hill Air Force Base. Um, and uh, I really loved that. It was an internship opportunity when I was in college. It allowed me to get to know the workings of the federal government and just how things operate uh, at, an, at a military installation. With that said, um, I really have a, a strong passion for enabling and empowering individuals to make um, what I would call informed or educated decisions as it pertains to themselves their careers and the things that they choose to do with themselves day to day. And so as we go through today's presentation, that's really my hope is that I am able to provide some insights to you related to the federal application process 
um, that will help empower you to feel more confident in the application process, uh, to, to feel as though you know a little bit more about how to go about doing things so that you can be successful uh, when you ultimately apply for federal positions. So um, as far as the organization that I work for goes, I want to provide an in introduction of DISA. So who is DISA and what do we do? DISA operates and defends what we call the Department of Defense Information Network, or the DODEN, right? That's another acronym. Um, we are really the IT services and communications uh, network provider for the Department of Defense and what we call the Fourth Estate. Um, fourth Estate are all of the government agencies and organizations that are not specifically related, perhaps, to the military. Um, and so uh, we all kind of fall in this general category, right? But with that said, we are not tied to a specific branch of the military. We support all of them. Um, and so, you know, that includes a lot of different areas, including the White House, um, as well as a lot of different areas across the federal government. All right. And so just to give you an idea of the scope of who we support and who we serve as an organization, like I said, we're supporting everybody within the federal government. Um, uh, you know, we have all of the various branches within the federal government government, the executive, legislative, um, and judicial branches, as well as the federal government across the board, with all of our military services and installations across the globe and uh, different combatant commands in support of our militaries uh, across the world. You can see here that DISA, because we have such a large mission, and we support so many different organizations across the globe, we do truly have a global presence, right? Um, as you can see, uh, we have several different uh, locations. We are headquartered out of Fort Meade in Maryland. It's about 35, 40 minutes north of, of the DC area. Um, however, we do have different field sites and offices across the United States and Europe and in other locations across the globe. Our workforce is made up of approximately 20,000 plus individuals. We do uh, utilize the services of both our civilian personnel, like myself, as well as active duty military members across the, the different branches of the military and a very large contractor workforce as well. Um, and so as you look uh, in uh, USA Jobs, where, where federal jobs are posted, and you look up Defense Information Systems Agency, you'll see there are a lot of different opportunities to work within our organization. Our bread and butter is really in cybersecurity and IT service management. However, uh, we we cover a lot of different opportunities, including you know the business management side of the house, human resources, training and development, etc. So hopefully that gives you a good understanding of who DISA Global, or excuse me, DISA is as a global organization and the mission that we support uh, for the government and, and uh, for our military members in the warfighter. All right, so let's, uh, now that we've gotten those introduction pieces over with, let's go ahead and just jump into uh, the meat of our presentation. So as I go through the presentation today, I'm going to I'm going to present to you a few different what I call big ideas or things that I hope that you take away from the presentation today that you really remember that you can apply uh, to your federal resume writing process. So the first big idea or thing that I want you to keep in mind is that traditional resumes or what you would do for private industry is not the same as a federal resume. Let me repeat that. Your traditional resume, what you've been trained to write and do all through high school, college, et cetera, that is not, it is not the same as a federal resume. And so the approach that you take in writing your federal resume should be different. Some things that I'd like to highlight that are different between the two. With your traditional resume, typically when you're writing a resume, the length is pretty short. It's meant to be concise. You're probably limited to one to two pages, right? Let's just really provide some high-level highlights of your experience and the things that you've done, and let's keep it as short and simple as we can. 
the formatting of your resume is going to depend from one person to another, right? Um, it's really based on personal preference. You have a lot more flexibility in how you present the information. Some people, it's really image heavy, uh, lots of colors, other things like that. Um, again, that's something that's a little bit different with the traditional resume. Um, I kind of touched base on this, but regarding the content of your resume, typically it's going to emphasize brevity, right? Meaning that it's meant to be concise. You're not, in, you're not uh, necessarily supposed to provide a lot of detail in regards to your resume statements. Let's keep them really short, one to two sentences at the most, right? In addition to that, when you talk about, I would say not necessarily the resume, but perhaps the application process in general, when we talk about the review process of your resume, with a traditional or private industry company, it's generally going to go directly to a hiring manager or perhaps an HR professional that is in charge of, of hiring for that organization. Um, we'll get into a little bit different, uh, explain the approach of how the federal government does reviews for application materials, as well as resumes, those kinds of things. So again, these are some of the things that you would expect uh, as they pertain to a, a traditional or what I call a private industry resume. Now let's go over to a federal resume, right? Talked about all these differences. So let's go over those different categories that I just mentioned and how they apply to a federal resume. So first, the length of your resume is gonna be a lot, lot different. Um, as I mentioned, a traditional resume is gonna be one to two pages. Your federal resume is gonna range anywhere from two to five or perhaps even more pages, right? So as an example, I have two different resumes. I have my private industry resume that's about two pages long. And then I have my federal resume that is about eight pages long, okay? And the reason for that, why is it so much longer is because the federal government expects that you will in, uh, follow very specific um, information requirements. You're going to include some specific details regarding the positions that you've held. Some of those things might include, uh, you know, um, the hours of work that you've had within a position, uh, the specific location, including address, your supervisor's information, etc. All of those details are included with every single job that you include on your federal resume. In addition to that, um, the content of your resume is going to be very different. The way that you approach emphasizing the skills that you've had or um, the responsibilities that you've had within a specific position is going to be much, much, much more detailed um, to, to showcase the specific skills that you have, right? It is, an, again, an expectation that your resume statements are going to be much longer than what you would find on a re federal resume. The review process also is going to be very... Um, I don't know if I'd say different, but much more in depth with the federal resume or federal application process than what you would find for a private industry. Within the federal government, there is a central HR office um, that does the initial review or evaluation of an individual's resume and application materials to determine if those individuals that have applied for a job are eligible for the position that they have applied for. That's all gonna depend on how well you have included the skills, knowledge, and uh, abilities that you have as they pertain to a position that you're applying for. So again, just in quick um, overview, again, the traditional resume, I do not want you to take the same approach to your federal resume as what you're used to doing with your traditional resume. So let's talk about practice crafting effective bullet points, right? I've gone into detail about how much detail, how much information you need to include in your federal uh, resume as it pertains to your responsibilities and things that you've done with the, within each of your positions. So how do you go about that? I would propose the that there is a somewhat simple formula that you can keep in mind as you are writing your resume statements. It goes as follows. This is what I did. This is how I did it. And these were the results, right? As long as you keep those three things in mind, when you are writing your resume statements, you will be successful, right? Um, as uh, the government has some pretty specific 
training as it relates to executives within the federal government. And the training or the model that they follow for executives is called the CCAR model, right? The CCAR model is another acronym. It stands for Challenge, Context, Action, and Result, right? What was the challenge? Let's provide some context as it pertains to the challenge and information that's needed to understand the situation. What was the action that you took? And what was the result? I would um, I would say that these are very similar, right? The CCAR method, um, this three-step kind of process that I've highlighted here, similar kind of thinking, right? What did you do? What was the situation? How did you go about taking action? And what were the results of your actions? The one thing that I would um, just make sure and emphasize for you is when you are mentioning any sort of results, we want you to make sure that you are highlighting measurable, um, perhaps quantitative or number-based outcomes or achievements as they relate to the action that you've taken. Right. So on this slide, I've included a couple of different examples. Um, this may pertain to your situation, it may not, but hopefully this gives you an idea of the approach that you might take in writing a resume statement. The first one is for that social media intern, right? And it states, created and curated engaging content for the university's social media platforms, implementing content calendars and visually appealing graphics to boost student engagement by 30% within three months. So again, what did they do? They created and curated engaging content. How did they do that? They implemented content calendars and visually appealing graphics. And what were the results? They boosted student engagement by 30% within three months, highlighting that measurable outcome. The next example is for a research assistant. They conducted data analysis. So what did they do, right? Assisted in research projects focused, focused on environmental sustainability, contributed to the publication of two research papers, on local biodiversity res preservation. So what did they do? Conduct a data analysis. How did they do that? They did research projects focused on environmental su sustainability. And, they and what were the results? They contributed to the publication of two research papers on local biodiversity preservation. So again, think about that. What did you do? How did you do it? And what were the results? So one of the more important things that you can do to allow yourself to be successful in any application process is to pay attention to the job posting on USA Jobs, right? USA Jobs is the online uh, system that the government uses across the entirety of the federal government to post jobs, to collect uh, applications, and to vet candidates, right? So any position that you want in the federal government should be on USA Jobs. Within each USA Jobs job posting, it is going to include very specific sections with very specific information. Some that I want you to pay particular attention to are going to be the duties section, the requirements section, how you will be evaluated, and the required documents. I want you to make sure that you're reviewing all of that information and then tailoring your resume to match those requirements or information in the job announcement, right? <clears throat> so let's go into uh, in a quick example for you of these different sections and things that I want you to pay attention to. So the first section is going to be the duty section. The duty section is going to provide you um, an introduction or overview of the responsibilities of the position that you are applying for, right? Um, this is an IT cybersecurity position that I've pulled up here, um, and specifically for customer support, right? Uh, and so you'll see here that they include some bullet points that highlights the duties or responsibilities of the position. Serves as a technical analyst and primary customer liaison, right, et cetera provides technical advice, et cetera, researches, evaluates, and provides feedback, reviews, validates, and standardizes problems, resolutions, et cetera. Um, the reason why you need to make sure that you've reviewed the duties for the position is when we go into your resume, 
when you are writing your resume statements, let's consider some transferable skills, right? From your personal background, what are some things that you have done that could support you or enable you to be successful in fulfilling these duties or responsibilities? Have you served as a technical uh, you know, support type person? Have you provided technical advice to individuals or IT support to individuals? Have you conducted any sort of research uh, for different maybe policies, procedures, issues, anything like that? And have you provided feedback to your supervisor, right? All those kinds of things could be really helpful for the individuals that review your application and eventually the person that decides who they're going to hire, right? What's going to set you apart? What are the transferable skills that you have? The next section I want you to pay attention to is going to be the requirements section, okay? The requirements section is going to include a lot of different points of information for you, um, including who can apply for the position, right? As you can see, must be a U.S. citizen is going to be pretty standard across any position within the federal government. You have to be a U.S. citizen or a U.S. national. Um, if you have any sort of work visa or other, other thing like that, typically you're not going to be considered eligible for the position because you have to be a U.S. citizen or hold U.S. national status in order to work for the federal government. Um, but there is going to include some additional information if a drug test is required. You'll see that there's shift work may be required. For my organization, we are a 24 by 7 operation. And so you may be working in the middle of the night, depending on the organization or position that you work in, right? Um, they're going to pay you more for that, but that's something to consider. Um, and so as you look in the requirements section, the conditions and employment section, that's going to be an important thing to pay attention to. <clears throat> the next is going to be the qualifications section. This is found under requirements, right? So within the federal government, you will find that they we are typically going to operate within um, what we call the GS or GG pay structure, at least within uh, DISA, that's how we operate. And so depending on what um, what GG or GS pay grade that the position falls under, there are going to be different qualification requirements that you will need to have, whether that's an educational requirement or a work experience requirement to be considered eligible for the position. And so when you look under the qualifications section, you will see there is going to include a basic requirements section, right? And you'll see that it lists that out in, in, in a lot of detail. Um, you have to have that, right? In order to be considered eligible for the position, you must meet all of the basic requirements. And you must not, not just meet those basic requirements, but you must show how you meet those basic requirements in your resume, right? Um, one thing they always say with those qualifiers that review your application materials, we cannot infer anything, right? We cannot say, oh, well, it looks like Bryce has this or meets this qualification based on his resume. You have to explicitly state that you meet these requirements in some form or fashion to be considered eligible. Again, we cannot infer anything for you when we are reviewing your application materials, right? So make sure that you're paying attention to these basic requirements and that you're including those in your resume. The other thing, uh, qualifying experience, right? Um, so as I mentioned, depending on the position, you're gonna fall under a specific pay grade. Specific pay grades are going to require specific uh, experience in order to be considered for those pay grades. So as you see here, it's been broken down. This specific position, uh, you could be hired at, at beginning at the GS-7 pay level all the way up to the GS-12 pay level, right? And so depending on the pay grade, um, it's going to specify the skills that you must have and demonstrate on your resume um, in order to be considered eligible for those positions or for those pay grades. Another thing to really pay attention to is going to be how you will be evaluated. 
again, every federal resume is going to, or excuse me, resume, every federal job posting is going to follow a similar format. It's going to include this instruction telling you how are you going to be evaluated. Um, very, very often or very, very common, you will see that a, um, a skills assessment or a skills questionnaire is included in the application process. The, the questionnaires typically are going to include some questions that say something like, uh, rate your skill level um, as it pertains to, let's say human resource management or supporting, supporting managers in hiring actions, right? You'll have a choice one, two, three, four, five, I, you know, have had classes that covers this, this information, but have not necessarily done it in a job, right? You could say, I have had an introductory responsibility or supported someone else that's responsible for this action, or it goes all the way up to, I am an expert and I train other people how to do this, right? So the questionnaire, um, you will always, if it's if it's part of the application process, you will always be able to preview the questionnaire to make sure that your resume and application materials support your responses to your question, right? Anybody can go through and say, I'm an expert for every single question on that on that questionnaire. But if they say they're an expert, the evaluators are going to go back to the resume and say, okay, this person said they're an expert in this area. Where on their resume does it indicate or show that they are an expert in that area, right? And so again, when you're when you're drafting your resume, when you're putting in all those different statements and things, make sure that you're paying attention to this job posting and paying attention to things like the questionnaire so that you're including those specific skill statements or experience statements so that you're supporting yourself so that they don't disqualify you because you didn't include a specific bit of information. Um, I hope that makes sense to all of you. It's a lot of information. The next section that I want you to make sure you pay attention to on any job posting is going to be the required documents section, right? Depending on the position you apply for, some of them may require that you upload official transcripts, okay? Others may require if you're trying to apply for a position um, and you have uh, a, you are a, a veteran, um, of the U.S. Armed Services. There's specific documentation you have to submit to show that you have that veteran status. If you've worked for the federal government before, then you will have what we call an SF-50. Um, that's your personnel record showing that you worked for the government, right? There's all kinds of things that you have to make sure are included in your application to be considered eligible. And the reason why is because, and I don't have this on my on my, uh, my slides, I apologize. But the reason why is because if you look on any job posting, you'll see on the right-hand side that a job is going to be open to specific what they call hiring pathways, or in other words, different groups of individuals that are, um, that are uh, eligible to apply for the position. Sometimes it's going to say, uh, U.S. citizens or open to the public, meaning anybody can go and apply. Other times it's going to say thing, it's going to specify that only, um, uh, uh, you know, current or past federal employees can apply, meaning that if you've never worked for the federal government, you cannot apply for the position. I mean, you can apply, but they won't find you eligible for the position, right? And so typically those hiring pathways are going to sh to come up here um, and they're going to include specific instructions in this required document section. Um, as it pertains to college students or university students, there are a lot of positions that we call recent graduate positions. And those are only open to individuals that have uh, graduated from college within the last three years, right? Um, so again, make sure you're paying attention to the required document section to ensure that you're providing what is required to support your application to be considered eligible. All right, so I've given you a lot of information today and I realize that. Um, some big ideas or some things that I want you to take away from today's presentation 
are first, remember, traditional resumes are not the same as a federal resume. So I don't, I do not want to hear about any of you going into USA Jobs and simply uploading the resume that you've already made and then expect that you're going to get hired within the federal government. It's not going to happen, okay? Um, you need to make sure that you have uh, a separate federal resume prepared that includes all the information. Um, as it pertains to writing a federal resume, one thing, a big recommendation I would have for you, when you go into USA Jobs, there's a tool in there called the Federal Resume uh, Writer or Generator, I think is what it's called, something like that. And it will take you step by step through the process of creating a federal resume to make sure that you have included all of the required information. All right. The next big idea that I want you to remember is when you are writing your resume experience statements, make sure that you are using meaningful language. Remember, this is what I did. This is how I did it. And these were the results. Or if you want to follow the example of our executives in the federal government, you could use the CCAR method. What was the challenge? Is there some context? What was your action? And what were the results of your action? Okay. Then the third big idea I want you to keep in mind or to remember is read the entire job announcement. I know that might seem a little daunting because federal job postings can be kind of long, right? But please, please, please read the entire job announcement. Just from that quick example, I showed you the different sections. There is some really important uh, information, not just information, but requirements listed in the job announcement that you have to have in your application. If you don't include it in the application, you will not move on in the uh, the the application process, you will be considered ineligible for the position. Okay, and then the last one, and maybe the most important thing that I want you to keep in mind or to remember, is to keep applying. And as you keep applying for federal jobs, keep improving. I do not want to see any of you submitting the same resume over and over and over again for different positions in the federal government. It's not going to work for you. Okay. Um, I also, the reason why I say keep applying is that it can be kind of daunting to go and find a job anywhere, but in the federal government, um, you can apply. I personally have applied for hundreds of jobs, okay, uh, throughout my career. And, uh, and I only have a handful of positions that I've held throughout my career, right? What does that mean? It means that the majority of the positions that I applied for, I'd never got hired for, right? Um, that's just the reality of the application process. It doesn't matter who you are, okay? That's just going to happen to any of us. And so, again, make sure that you don't get too discouraged. Um, please keep applying. And again, keep improving. Make sure that you're participating in these kinds of, of uh, webinars and uh, that you are, are um, updating your resume and application materials on a regular basis. Let's use tools that are available to you to improve those statements and just keep, keep uh, doing what you can to make sure that you're providing the best um, resume and application that you can. And you will find that as you keep applying and keep improving, you will find positions that are exciting, that are fulfilling, and you will be hired uh, for those positions. So that uh, concludes the formal portion of the presentation that I have for you today. I am more than happy to answer any questions that you have. So I will now open the floor to your questions. I see if a hand you raised. Please feel yeah. free to raise your hand and make sure you unmute your mic. Thank you so much. All right, Anastasia, I believe. Um, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question, go ahead. If you're unable to um, unmute yourself or don't have a mic, you're welcome to use the chat and ask your question there. I am monitoring the chat as well. Yes.
And I, I have unmuted all microphones, so if if they do need to talk, they can. Thank you. Anastasia, are you there? Okay, yes, it works now. Great, thank you. All right, so hello. Hello. Um, quick question for you. I know when it on USA Jobs, it'll often list you need this many years of work experience. Mm -hmm. How do you figure out what constitutes relevant work experience? when trying yeah, to see if you a, meet basic qualifications. Yeah, that's a great question. Let me see. Um, I'm going to try to stop the other screen sharing. Let me go ahead and try to pull up USA Jobs and jump into a job posting real quick. And let's see if I can find an example for you. Can you all see USA Jobs as I'm pulling it up here? Perfect. Thank you for that confirmation. All right, let's pull up this one. So IT cybersecurity specialist position. Qualifying experience. Okay. So, um, so when you look at it again, when we follow that that GG or GS, they mirror one another. So if you see GS, GG is the same thing. Um, Typically, you're gonna you're going to see it's gonna follow one of two different formats, right? The the first is going to be specific about the qualifying experience, right? And so it's gonna say experience assisting and researching customer desktop issues. Um, this is for that GG seven position. Typically, we're gonna see that your introductory pay grades are gonna fall anywhere between the GS uh, GS or GG five to the GG or GS seven pay grade. Okay, um, and so this one, it specifies what that experience is, right? Um, typically, to be considered for a specific position, they want you to have one year of experience doing whatever it might be, right? So for this GS7 or GG7, we want this type of experience for a minimum of one year. For a, uh, for a nine, it's experience assisting, troubleshooting, documenting customer inquiries, and are providing technical advice and assistance to customers. Again, that's one year or 52 weeks, uh, whatever it might be. You'll see on here, um, this particular job posting includes some trade-off statements is what we call them, or substitution statements, meaning that you can have, uh, for a seven, you can have one full year of graduate level education, right? And it specifies the different areas of study. Um, and then for the nine, a master's degree, completed master's degree, or two full years of uh, of higher education, graduate level experience, a GG11 is going to have a PhD or an equivalent doctoral degree with three years of progressively higher education, higher level education, right? So this, um, I would say with experience, it's going to depend on the position. For education, um, they will all follow pretty much this same requirement, okay? Whether it's the seven, the nine, the 11, the G, G or GS5, you'll see it's going to be either a completed bachelor's degree or so many years of school within a bachelor's degree type program, okay? That's what you'll see at that five level. Um, so, so I guess, I hope that helps answer your question. Um, it's going to depend on the job posting. That's one example. Let me see if I can show you another quick example. Let's see. Just to give you some different requirements, qualifications. Okay, so um, the qualifying experience, right? This one's the 13 level. This is a, a higher level position. So you have to, um, you'll see that, that uh, 
every position should include what we call a specialized experience uh, requirement or statement. And that is here, okay? This is what constitutes as the experience, the specialized experience that you have to have to be considered for this pay grade, okay? So again, every position is gonna follow that. You'll see for this one, this is different. There is no substitution of education for experience at the GG13 or the GS13 level. That's going to be pretty pretty standard across the, across the board. All right, so I hope that answers that question. Do we have other questions? If you have questions, um, I know you're raising your hands. I appreciate that. Go ahead and just unmute yourself. We have several individuals, so um, go ahead and unmute yourself and just uh, just ask a question. Rich Franklin. Uh, Rich, let's go go ahead and answer your or ask your question. Rich, if you're trying to speak, you are muted. Uh <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what's going on. I'm uh, uh, raise your hand. Let's see if we can find that hand. Let me see if I can um, unmute you. Rich, while we're waiting, can you go ahead and type the question in the chat, please, so we can fix this issue? I think yes, I'm uh, able to go now. Okay, All right. appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for this valuable information. I always felt like understanding this uh, way. Um, I think before. Traditionally, I would just put in a resume and um, hopefully it went through. Um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I, I got denied in all, all of them um, pretty much. But so I really appreciate this information. To follow up on the, um, the question the last person had, um, I wanted to ask, um, is there a specific amount of hours a master's usually um, equates to? Because um, I know it said here. Um, you know, a master's degree and somewhat out like a certain amount of hours. Um, is there a specific amount that a master's or a bachelor's equates to? Um, that's a great question. It's a, it's probably going to depend on on which um which college or university you attend. Uh, but typically, when you have an education requirement, you're going to be asked to provide some official transcripts with your application. And um, and so it's going to depend on the graduate program, right? Some, I don't know if, if it's necessarily a number of credit hours per se, or if it's specifically just a number of classes. And the reason why I say that, so for example, when I went through my master's program, I participated in an accelerated master's degree program. I finished in one year, okay? Mm -hmm. And the reason why I was able to finish in one year is because I took far, far more credit hours uh, during a single semester than what you would find with a traditional um, traditional master's program. Most master's degree programs are going to be a length of two years, right? And they're going to include so many hours. So I don't know if there's a specific number of credit hours that, that I would say, um, mm -hmm. uh, but more it's just, uh, you know, going to be kind of the length of time that you have within that master's program. So if we go back into this into this example to uh, job posting, it should specify, let's see here. Yeah, it doesn't specify a number of credit hours, it just says one full year, right? So if you have one full year within whatever master's program that you are going and participating in, then you should be good to go, regardless of the number of credit hours. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Nelson, we have a question from. Yes, I see that. Um, what is the average timeline between when an application is submitted, reviewed, and approved or disapproved? Oh boy, isn't that the question everybody wishes that we had an answer for? Um, the reality is the answer to that question is it's going to depend. 
because we have that central HR office, um, it's DFAS, the Defense Finance and Services Administration. Because we have that central HR office, it's going to really depend on who the qualifier is and how quickly they act. Um, I would say once a job posting has closed, um, so let's see if I can show you what I mean. When you look at this job posting, it was it's open from uh let's see November 27, 2023, um, to February 26, 2024. So this one's closing pretty soon. Once that job posting closes, typically the evaluator is going to review all the applications within um, I believe it is 10 business days or approximately two weeks. Okay. So ideally you should get some sort of notification on whether you are considered some, uh, it's called an eligibility notice, right? Um, that basically means that the evaluator went in, looked at your application and said, uh, you know, either they are eligible based on their application, based on the requirements in the job posting, or they're not eligible. That should happen within, I would say two to three weeks, ideally, of when the job posting closes. Um, when the, let's see, when the reality is, um, it could be longer than that. Uh, again, it's going to depend on the evaluator, um, depend on the, on their timelines, how quickly they go. Um, but I would say you should hope to find out something within the two to three weeks timeframe. If you have not heard anything from them within that two to three week time frame. On every job posting, there is going to be an agency contact information section with a phone number and an email address. So I would say if you've not found out anything within two to three weeks after the job closes, feel free, feel welcome to go ahead and contact them and ask for a status update, right? Um, let's see here. Will there be feedback after submitting an application? <sighs> uh, the, the honest answer is typically probably not very much. Um, I wish that they provided more feedback than they do. Um, the type of feedback that you'll find, let me see if I can give you a, a kind of a timeline. On USA Jobs, let's see, federal application process. If we talk about the timeline, right? Oh, this doesn't give me much information. Well, I guess it kind of does. Agency interview. No, it doesn't. Okay. Um, so so typically within the, the process, you submit your application, the evaluator reviews your application, you will get uh, an eligibility notice. It's via email to say whether you are eligible or not eligible. That's all it says. Okay. Um, if you are found ineligible, um, it won't give you much detail stating why. Okay. Unfortunately. Um, it may include a general statement, right? It basically stating based on your uh, experience or background, you were found ineligible for this position. If you want more detailed feedback, you can always contact that, that HR point of contact that's listed in the job posting. Other, otherwise, it's not going to provide too much. The next process is if you are found eligible, you're going to get what's called a referral notice, okay? Um, basically, what that means is either you have been referred or not referred to the hiring manager over the position. That means that the evaluator found you eligible and let's say you are referred, that means they've handed off your resume and application to the hiring manager uh, for their evaluation to decide, do you wanna be, do they wanna interview you or not, okay? Again, not much detail is included, um, but that's that's that step in the process. Um, if you're not referred again, it's going to include a general statement saying you've not been referred based on your background or experience, right? Um, if uh, and then it becomes a little less formal, more of your traditional format. If they want to interview you, they'll contact you by email or or phone number, um, and uh, or they should notify you in some form or fashion. Um, at the end of the process, when the job is closed, meaning they've made a selection, you're supposed to get a status update from the system uh, showing whether the job has been closed or not, right? Anyway, so 
uh, a lot of information, but I'm trying to provide as much context and information as I can so you understand what to expect. So the short answer is probably not too much information. If you want specific feedback, I would encourage you to reach out to the HR point of contact that's listed on the job posting. All right, do we have other questions? Let's see application. All right, I see another one came in through chat. Does each application show the contact of HR? Uh, yes, it, it should include a contact uh, information. Sometimes it's not gonna include a specific person, but it will include the contact information of a an HR center, right? With like a group email or a uh, the center phone number. Another question. If I want to write a resume for more than two pages, should I include experience of student service learning from middle school or college? Um, I would encourage you to include all of the pertinent information that could highlight transferable skills, knowledge, abilities as it pertains to the job that you're applying for, right? So if you have experience from middle school or high school that is applicable to the job that you're applying for, go ahead and include it in your resume. Um, don't be shy about that. Uh, if you have volunteer experience, if you participated in any sort of clubs or organizations, right, anything like that, that you think could support your job application, please include it on your federal resume. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Hey, I think we are all done with questions. Everyone, please give a great Zoom round of applause to Mr. Nelson for his time, knowledge, and wisdom that he imparted to us today. It's been very, very helpful. Um, Mr. Nelson or Mr. Um, Gibbs, I'm not sure who has the QR code for the students to sign in and do their surveys real quick, but can I please get that on the screen um, so they can have that? Thank you so much. Students, take a few minutes. Please scan this code. This will be your sign-in sheet. And as stated, complete the survey. It's all in one. Do that for me quickly before you leave. I did see someone ask if this clip will be available. Um, Mr. Nelson has provided um, great information for me to pass along to students um, in the form of PDL. So if you are in need of reminders, feel free to email careers at captechu.edu, again, careers at captechu.edu, and ask um, for a copy of the documents that he did leave for you all. He has given us great um, tips. Um, some things, if you all have attended my workshops on traditional resumes, he has said a lot of key things. Um, and I thank you, Mr. Nelson, for reiterating that, that will eliminate confusion when it comes to you submitting your as we state, uh, traditional resumes to corporate businesses versus, or should I just say non-government um, sectors versus government sector. So if you are in that place or space and you are trying to get to um, put together your government resume, once again, email careers at captechu.edu. Once again, students, you cannot rush this process either. You have to take your time to make sure you include everything that Mr. Nelson spoke of, okay? It's almost like doing a, uh, an essay in English class. And the benefit is nobody can tell me more about you than you, okay? So take your time. Let's start compiling this information and getting you these great government jobs that you are searching, searching for. Is that a question? Okay, no. Any other questions, comments, concerns before we leave this great workshop? I didn't see any hand claps. I need some hand claps. Y'all didn't give uh, Mr. Nelson any hand claps, any thank yous. Thank you, Donald. Appreciate you. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zoe. Appreciate you all. We always show appreciation to those who impart into us, okay? Um, the great thing is, just, uh, did I say it right, Mr. Nelson? Yes, ma'am. Oh, just checking. I'm about to say, you can put me out saying it wrong. They will be at the career fair on March the 8th, okay? So be sure to look out for the table and the representatives who are there on March the 8th to ask any questions or just bring comments to them from what you've learned today 
most definitely checking out their interns and job opportunities. Again, Mr. Nelson, thank you so much. Mr. Gibbs, thank you so much. Students, thank you so much. Staff, who's also on here, and faculty, thank you so much for your attendance. I hope you all stay safe. Have a great weekend, and thank you so much for your time. Everyone take care.